Okay, so um, welcome to our uh, Falling Walls Roundtable on Science and Entrepreneurship for a Circular Future. I'm very excited about today. Uh, my name is Heba Agib. I'm the Chief Executive for the RESPOND program at the BMW Foundation and Executive at the BMW Foundation. The BMW Foundation's mission is about inspiring responsible leadership and leaders who we believe can contribute to changing the world to be a better place, in fact. And RESPOND was established um, in order to infuse the mindsets of responsible leadership in the leaders behind technology and innovation. And we are here to talk about size and entrepreneurship because they're very well connected and very close in order to make us able to change this world in a positive way. I'd love to welcome my panelists and guests here, which we are good friends and had a very exciting pre-conversation, so it's going to be very exciting, I can guarantee. I'll start with Dr. Um, Anna Lamb, who is uh, an, a scientist and entrepreneur. Um, she um, holds a PhD in process uh, engineering from Hamburg University of Technology. She is the um, co-founder and CEO of Traceless. And in case you haven't been here yesterday, Traceless um, is the science um, breakthrough startup of the year 2021 here at Falling Walls. So please give it a clap. <laughs> the winner is here yesterday. Thank you. And I'm very proud to say that um, they are uh, one of the 10 response startups this year. Um, Fritjof Tetzner, we know each other for two years now. He um, is a founder, investor, and adventurer. Uh, he, in fact, had his first startup uh, founded when he was 16, Jimdo, many of you may know it. Um, and after an exciting trip, he decided to uh, found Plan A, uh, Planet A, sorry, um, which is about investing in startups that are trying to achieve the sustainable development goals, um, the SDGs. Um, he's a climate investor. Um, so, Fritz of Desna, thank you for being here. Uh, and I have to say here, thank you for jumping in. We had um, Dr. Stefan von Halsbrink planned for this panel who cannot um, be here today with us. Um, I'm getting a sign. Ah, oh, okay, it's not for me. Great. And our uh, third uh, panelist or roundtable contributor, Helen Burdett. It's great to have you here. She is the head of circular economy at the World Economic Forum. And um, she um, established the, initi um, initi the initiative uh, Scale 360, which she will tell us about more. Um, and she is also one of the contributors uh, to our Tech for Good report 2021. Thank you for being here, Helen. Um, I'll start the panel by giving you each three minutes, and I see the clock here, so we need to fit in time and be very brief. Um, to have a statement or an impulse on who you are and why you think that science and entrepreneurship should and has to play a role in um, achieving a circular future. Anna, I'll start with you. Great, yeah, thanks. So, as Heba already introduced, um, I'm an entrepreneur, scientist, and also I'm a circular economy enthusiast. So, fits perfectly here. Um, I founded Traceless last year um, by the principles of cradle to cradle. Um, who of you knows cradle to cradle? Some? Perfect. So um, it's basically, basically a way of producing our things in a circular way, um, producing our products. That was a concept that um, catch me when I was in studies already, because I didn't want to contribute with my process engineering studies to business as usual, linear production from cradle to grave. And um, so I joined this cradle to cradle NGO move movement and had this mindset in my engineering head and my scientist head um, all the way long. And in Traceless, I then found a company um, exactly doing that, producing products in a way that they can be recycled, that materials flow in continuous cycles. And um, I think it's very important, especially for scientists, to have this mindset in head that for every process and every product that we design and that we 
create from the scratch, we need to have this mindset of being circular. That's very important, and that's what I also miss a lot in universities. So cradle to cradle or circular economy is not was not really part of my lectures or of the yeah, PhD that I was in. Mm -hmm. And the second part is the entrepreneur. So also that is needed more in universities to really encourage PhDs to bring their circular products um, or circular ideas into the market. So yeah, that's what I tried with Traceless. And um, last year we founded the company. And um, yeah, we are producing a novel biomaterial that can be integrated into the biological cycle after use. Just in short. That's great, Anna. And we'll go to your journey and how you decided to switch from being scientist to entrepreneur or bring it together in a second. Fritjof, your statement. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I said, I started quite early and actually by chance, my first company was 16. Um, and so I was going down the route of building a company from three boys on a farmhouse, basically, while being a school to now 300 people with Jim Lu. And um, that, that actually taught me a lot and, and also brought me to this privileged position where I can really decide what I want to do next. And my step next um, in 2017 was um, to travel the world with a DB crew for 120, 120 days. And we took um, 10 out of the 17 UN sustainable development goals and shells for each of the episodes. And um, to be honest, it was one of the most challenging experiences I ever had because we wanted to portray the solutions of founders which are tackling these problems. So we had to show them also the problems. And to me, that was a massive learning experience. Um, like, I don't know, talking to people on a landfill, to children on a landfill, sorting out the trash or the adults, or talk to people, I don't know, dealing with climate change in Central India. And, um, it kind of left a mark for me. It's like, whoa, that was a lot. And I'm a, this prototype of a privileged German. And whenever I came back, it's like, what, what can I do? And basically, well, how can I respond? And, and one of the answers I was giving to myself then after a period of time was like, OK, I want to help the founders, which actually help the world, and actually contribute my resources and time to the ones that are doing meaningful, significant change. But in, er in order to really determine what is significant, I think you, you do need to take a step back. And in venture capital, normally, you only look at the teams and you look at the business plan to determine whether to invest, yes or no. And so as we were setting up Planet A, we were sure as a team coming together that we're going to do that differently. And we take science actually into account of the investment decision itself. So my co-founder, she has a science background, and we have a fully employed scientist as well. So basically, we look through three angles, team, business plan, and the science as well, and only invest if all of them are super positive. And so I would say it's, it's really important to look through this lens as well in order to fund the startups which are doing meaningful change. Uh, Friedrich, thanks so much, and we'll be excited to hear more about that because it's really rare to have science and evidence-based investments um, in this context, in the circularity context. Um, Helen, to you. Thank you. So I think what really unites kind of this panel is you know being the circular enthusiasts, and we each come at it from a different perspective. And the World Economic Forum is a platform for public and private collaboration. And I think as we look at science and entrepreneurship, we can think about even the tracks of falling walls that we're experiencing today from physical sciences to the social sciences and how science looks at the world around us and how entrepreneurship is the connection of that into business. I think we're talking about entrepreneurship through the kind of name of the panel, but I would also bring in intrapreneurship in that we can look at innovation more broadly and the systems that uh, innovators work within in which their ideas can thrive, whether within an organization or kind of within an innovation ecosystem as a startup entrepreneur or someone really pushing for scale. And tying all of that and those systems back into circular with the basis that circular is really disrupting our economy. It is changing the way that we do business. That, you know, Anne talked about kind of take, make, waste, and cradle to cradle, and cradle to grave, and all of these are, are really terms for how we pull resources from the earth, 
We create materials out of them. We use those materials. And then they go into landfills. And we cannot continue that way. I think it's apparent to everyone sitting here, kind of anybody who stops and thinks about that. Yet a study came out uh, just last week, actually, uh, through Qualtrics and SAP and, and the forum. It was a global survey. And one of the questions was on uh, zero waste and adopting zero waste practices. And between reuse and repair and purchasing things that have reusable packaging and using less, purchasing less, in every geography, purchasing less came in last as, a, as an adoptable zero use strategy. And so business does need to, to recognize the circular economy and, and there's such opportunity for entrepreneurs to change the way that people are uh, kind of thinking about this, but also to capitalize on that opportunity so that the products that are being created and consumed, recognizing the world that we live in, are circular. That's a very important aspect. And leadership and the decisions that leaders take is such an important aspect to that. And we need to all be working at the same time on, on clear goals and targets to, to make that shift needed happen. Thank you so much, Helen. So I'm, I'm struggling seeing the time here behind. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a round of questions and then open for the floor of questions. So whenever you feel like you want to be part of the, the discussion, just uh, please go ahead. Um, Anna, it's, um, it's so uh, interesting to know your, to hear about your journey from doing pure science to bring science into entrepreneurship. And uh, being myself a scientist and an innovator at the heart, I know how difficult it is. Like you said, we didn't have it at school. We didn't study it at university. It was all about the process engineering or the mechanical engineering of things. What inspired you to do the shift? So in Germany, especially in Germany, in the education system as an engineer, you, our, your clear goal is to work in a corporate. <laughs> in a big company and then the aim is reached. So, um, but I realized that, of course, this corporates, well, as a process engineer, you can work in the plastic industry or in the chemical industry. These, they have their strategies, their way, their values, and they are part of the problem. And I didn't see that they will shift to being part of the solution. So I, and I said that if we want to make a change, I think it's easier <laughs> to start something new because you're quicker and you can also define your own values from the beginning. Because in circular economy, it's so crucial that you do everything right in the beginning. It's not just adding something recyclable content in your product and then you're a little greener. But in, if you really want to contribute to circular economy, you need to reinvent the products again from scratch. And this is so difficult in, in corporates. So actually, for me, it just happened that I then decided, okay, I'll bring that to market in my own company. But, and then also, you have much more opportunities to then yeah, find your own, own way. And that's a great example then, that when you take it as your um, mission, so to say, you can reach it, you can make the shift, you can make it happen. You also just closed the seed round and another uh, grant commitment from the EIC. Um, these are milestones. Um, how do you see these uh, steps uh, changing the materials industry when we talk about circular? So, yeah, if you talk about materials industry, it's also already in the word material. It's not software-based, <laughs> it's hardware. <laughs> um, so, producing a novel material means that you need to scale production, you need to build plans, you need ha money for hardware, and I think that's very important also for, for in case of the investment, right? That we are not a SaaS startup, that we can uh, multiple our, our um, revenues and, and, and scale very, very fast, but it just needs time to build up this, this hardware. And I think, um, yeah, that's the, the real difference, but in the end, uh, we, have, we will have new materials. And I, I'll use a sentence you told me that most of the investors say it when you, they talk about your startup. If you were a SaaS solution, we would have interested, uh, have been interested to immediately invest in you. 
But being a hardware solution, that takes a lot of more time for returns, so maybe not. This is a sentence you hear very often as a hardware. We, we have heard Stand that, down. but then we also say, okay, then maybe not. <laughs> then we are looking for other investors that really understand the problem and the solution, the, and the potential in the solution. So looking for those who understand the core of what you're trying to achieve and your core values is very important in terms of investments. And yes, yes, yeah. totally. So we also experienced some interested investors that just wanted to, full, to fill up their green portfolio. And for us, it is very crucial that our investors understand the holistic impact that we do and that they also support us, like our current investor, Planet A, support us in, for example, performing the, the measurement of our impact. Because through the measurement of our impact, we have the proof to the outer world that we actually doing um, a significant improvement in all impact indicators. And that is, was very important for us that our investors also focus on these uh, impact indicators. It's a very important aspect, impact measurement and quantification and making, making impact measurement like profit is measurement, uh, measurable is, is a very important aspect to that. And Fritjof, now, as an investor, I know you're a climate investor, we we'll come to that later, but as an investor, what is more difficult in investing in, in, is there more difficulty in investing in science-based startups with the hardware, labs, and all of that in the background? Or do you see it um, differently? I mean, yeah, it's definitely more complex than software. Like, my, my own background is software, so in order to evaluate, if you want to um, invest into a, a hardware-based science startup, you, you do need to more, have more knowledge. And, um, but the way we, we have been coming together as a team is basically um, we thought, hey, this quantification is really important when making investment decisions. And, and what, what we do is um, that we go deeper and really compare, for example, on a startup, which is a plastic alternative, to then the virgin plastic world. And then look on a really holistic level on life cycle assessment and compare the two products, basically, on a per product level. And like super interestingly, in, in the case of traceless, like you, you're using a byproduct of the agriculture waste, which is like normally not really. You're investing in traceless, just uh, to give you the context yeah. here. <laughs> yes, thanks for pointing that out. Um, and so, um, so basically, if you look really holistically on what what they're achieving and how they're producing their product and why it's so much better, and compared to the, today's world. You, you do give them an argument why the solution is better, and in the case of what um, of, of traceless, they've been winning a huge deal based also on the evidence of their claims, and I think that is something important that as a seed stage company that you can underline what you're really doing by science as well to say, hey, this is the change we bring to the world. And it's unique that you bring a science team in your investment team in order to take the right decisions for investing in climate action or circular economy. That's a very unique approach. How did you come to that decision, actually? It basically, really, like, looking for me back from my journey, it's like I've seen all the problems, and um, I think if you look at what we're funding right now, not all of them are part of the solution, really. And in order to determine what to do and what not to do, I think you have to have this different sort of mentality when it comes to investment decisions. And I would say that mentality is that you have, you have to give the science a voice in the investment committee itself, like in the decision-making process. And the downside of that is that you have to say no to things which are not significantly better, but I do believe that in the future we will see more and more regulations that actually <laughs> play, will play out for companies like Tracer and others because basically we have to get to this shift to really circular or to kind of climate mitigation to all the other topics. And like basically, th these companies have to be the winners of the transformation. Otherwise, we're all going to have a huge problem. And by us having an early indicator of what the significance of, of the difference a company can, can do, we might also have a really good indicator for the future monetary success of the company. And I'm, I'm not saying we can apply that to every case, but we see more of these cases. And so I think it is also a good edge to go deeper into the data to re really analyze if something is part of the solution, yes or no. 
Yeah, that's great. And uh, I attended one of your sessions where you were talking more about the methodology. Um, um, there is a fact that there are just a few, that although we are in Germany very strong in science and innovation, there are just a few business models that are exciting when we talk about business. So maybe if you can tackle that point mm -hmm. briefly and then I go to Helen. I mean, <clears throat> basically um, another example of a company invested in, they're doing um, synthetic fuels, which also can look at from a from circular point of view, right? So they're using uh, green hydrogen and direct air capture CO2 and they produce then um, green, like um, or synthetic kerosene to power aviation. And there, I think it's a good example because um, what they now they you see global rising levels of synthetic fuels um, until 2030 that more and more countries are actually putting in regulations to to have this number increase. And I think um, by being able to then see a regulation is changing in a certain way and companies are involving to tackle that. I think it's super nice to look through this angle as well. And I think that's what we're trying to apply to more and more. But for us as a fund, it's super independent on the regulation which is happening because um, the more the regulation is pushing in that direction, the more solid ground for, for then companies is there to foster and to, to actually do innovation. So I, I think it's, it's really interconnected. Helen, we discussed briefly about climate action, circular economy, that uh, there are investment in this and that. Are they different to you? Is it one thing? I'm glad you asked, actually. I heard from both of you a climate action or circular economy, you know, using kind of those in a sentence as one after the other. And one thing that we kind of have been driving forward more and more with our partners is that circular economy can be a means to an end with climate. That so much of the work that we do in food, in plastics, in supporting nature and nature-based solutions and circular economy is all targeted at climate mitigation, at changing the direction that we're on. We're in a climate emergency. COP26 is happening right now and kind of everywhere you turn, you will see this. And circular economy sometimes gets sidelined as a, as a waste play. I mentioned landfills earlier. And I think it's important to kind of keep in mind that, I mean, in the four hardest to abate sectors, by 2050, circular economy can help reduce emissions by 40%. That if we look at this at an industrial level, circular economy can tackle climate change. And in your initiative, like Scale 360 and these initiatives, what, what are you expecting to see as an outcome? And why do you decide that alliances are so important to come forward? I think the importance of alliances really <laughs> underscores all of our initiatives, maybe not just Scale 360, but Thank I, can, <laughs> I can I can, take a, a, take a step back and describe maybe what Scale 360 is. Its name isn't necessarily self-explanatory, but it's the forum's initiative focused on circular innovation, so supporting innovation around the world. And we kind of create these initiatives based on what we hear from governments and uh, the largest companies that are members of the forum to understand kind of where there is a need and then how we can tackle it. So we studied uh, kind of how the fourth industrial revolution technologies, so we talk about the fourth industrial revolution with new technologies from the hardware that we've been discussing uh, to you know, AI and, and many different solutions and robotics. How can those technologies help bring about a circular future? And we studied this specific to plastics and electronics, but it more broadly, kind of how can we then support technology to help solve for these challenges? And our first step was to go uh, listen to experts, understand what support there already is. Uh, and what we learned and, and what we heard is that there's really space at a local level, that an idea if it's brought up in a meeting and immediately gets shut down, it's not going to become a company. That it's creating an environment where ideas can thrive, where, com where small companies can scale. And this means looking at policy, this means looking at the financial uh, and investment climate at a city level, at a local level. It means innovation challenges and accelerator programs, uh, but it isn't a one size fits all. Running a challenge everywhere won't necessarily help, nor will a policy working group. 
And so Scale 360 created a playbook that takes our partners from a desire to do something, so recognition that I need to help support this system and our organization, whether it's a ministry or an industry group or a private sector company, uh, can invest in that. We can take action, we can build something. And our playbook takes them from that state into evaluating the ecosystem, bringing people to the table, bringing entrepreneurs and innovators to the table, bringing public sector stakeholders and policymakers, bringing the finance community and bringing companies that have the demand and saying, where are things breaking down? Why aren't companies that have a, a circular lens scaling? Social enterprises are 43% more likely to scale than those that do not have a social and for-profit mission. And so we know that they are investable, investable and in different environments, there can be different approaches. And so the playbook kind of walks through this and says, this is what you can do. And we work with partners over kind of six months to a year. And so over the past year, we've grown from two countries to 21 countries uh, with kind of goals of expanding more by reaching more geographies and creating a community of those individuals that want to support circular innovators and connecting them into the forums communities. Yeah, and this, I think, is, I believe is very important because we talk a lot about how much disruption needs to be taking place in order to reach circular economy. And we don't talk about how this is going to be a global issue and tackling and, and, and bringing everyone on board globally, emerging markets, other markets. Um, I feel like we sometimes work talking about the planet as if it's not round, as if there are like there's a half year and the plate here and something here, not about a holistic approach. What needs to be done there, like looking at the different needs in different areas? I kind of talked about localization and, and going into kind of specific mm -hmm. cities and countries and building programs that are best fit for purpose that, you know, sitting, at, looking at it from a global lens, I'm not the one to say what needs to happen. That's why, yeah. you know, those that are delivering it and bringing together individuals who know a lot more than I do are making those decisions. But I think you also touch on an important point that it is not enough to be circular, that we need to be safe and inclusive and just and circular. And circular economy, by its very nature, is disrupting economies. Uh, to transition to circular, you are breaking down the way our economy currently works. And that often puts those who are most vulnerable at risk. And so in any disruption, uh, ensuring that you're thinking beyond circular with the solution uh, is kind of an important part of any program. That's a very important aspect. And private and public investors and decision makers needs to be need to be talking about this globally. It's really um, there's a lot to be done there um, when you look at how we solve the problem. I'll open now to uh, questions from the audience. If you are there any questions already, please. Okay. Okay, okay I'll start again. Um, so I was wondering uh, when we talk about the UN Sustainability Development Goals, we have a target for 2030 which one year is done, and uh, we have nine years to go. Uh, I somehow feel that when we talk about everything about climate and circular, it's always in the future, and we don't define that future. I feel they should, what is your opinion? My opinion is that there should be some kind of grading, where there is short, mid, and long, and everything has to fit into that, because it's not like a final race that we're gonna win. We have to show progress, and I just was wondering what is yours? Who wants to take on that uh, very important question? So I, I also believe like uh, we, we need to plan today forward how to get from now step by step incrementally towards a better future. But we also need to think of the vision of the future and where we want to get to and start working on it today. Do you feel that there's enough being done in both directions or are we stuck somewhere? I mean, um, the obvious answer is there's not enough done, there's no milestones, and that's what we see at COP. Um, so, yeah, like I couldn't agree more. Um, I think it really levels, um, I, th I think maybe maybe us, we are in different fight levels. And so basically you're doing one one innovation which is super super critical, and you, you, you're really focusing on that, and that has a certain set of goals. And we as an investor, we kind of look at a range of companies, maybe 30 companies, and you're kind of more of like really dealing with ecosystems and goals here. And I think um, we, we all should apply 
that questions to our thinking and our our, our actions. And um, to me, I would answer that is like, okay, with with Planet A, we look at kind of four categories we judge things. So that is climate mitigation, waste reductions, resource resource efficiency, and biodiversity protections. And we try to come up with numbers for the investments to be specific, and then kind of compare that to today's economy. That's how we're going to put it into action with us as, an, as a fund. But really, I think um, it might be a different answer for you because you have something really specific you're working on and, and might be different for you. So it really depends on how you translate that to your organization, I would say. Like, Anna, maybe like with a startup, you need to be focused. And at the same time, you're actually tackling a global <laughs> challenge. So what is the challenge for you in this context? And what also talking about scaling up and making solutions available globally immediately if they're working well uh, and adapted to the communities that are, um, it needs to serve, what do you need to scale up your solution so that's available for more people, solving more problems? So I think um, we are still in the face of understanding so that when we also see that when we talk to our clients or potential customers that we need to do a lot of education first before we get talking because the understanding of circular economy is not the same in every head. I think so a lot of people, especially the plastic topic, is very highly emotional and also every company with whom we are speaking has a different strategy. Like, oh, we are more going into biodegradables, we are more going into recycling, we are more going into reduction... But no, there is one, actually one concept how we can go to a circular economy. So, um, and that is doing the right things and producing products that are just fully recyclable, right? And not just, oh, we're already reducing a little bit of the material. So that's our approach. We need to have the same understanding that this is not enough. We need to produce our products in a way that they can be recycled fully recycled, with the same material quality. That's not easy. A lot of products are mixed together, mixed materials, and you cannot separate them in the end. And so there's a lot of effort to be done to redesign these products. And it will take a long time, more, more than nine years, I guess. And that's the, the phase where we're in. Now, you decided to start the startup because you realized that starting from scratch is much easier than trans forming corporates, we need to take into consideration also that larger companies need to get on board with that. I go to you, Helen. What do companies need? What needs to be done in order to reach circular? I, I'll kind of take maybe both of those yes, questions please. a little, yes, a little bit. A little and, bit. And, may, and, and also a call for the next question until we close that round. Please feel free to walk <laughs> to the microphone. But we close that round of questions. Yeah. Well, and, and that's around that we do need the impact measurement at different levels. I think impact measurement already came up. We recently did a whole kind of deep dive in how are we measuring the impact of systems change programs, which is its own different form of complexity. But I would say we can't let uh, kind of a too holistic or, or an approach that is too black and white keep us from acting. Or we can't get too tied up in, in measurement to keep us from acting. Not that we shouldn't do those things. Not that we shouldn't say, no, we need the whole circular future and we do need to measure our results. We also need to just do it. Uh, that we need to kind of be taking actions and those can be from a materials perspective. They can also be business models and processes. And you know, it, it, there are many approaches to circularity. Uh, we can share a common end uh, and find a lot of different ways to getting there. I think the companies that we see the most progress and change for and those that are part of the platform for accelerating circular economy and, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the Africa Circular Economy Alliance and the Latin America Circular Economy Coalition and there are governments and companies coming together to say what can we do instead of what can I do. And I think the pre-competitive space is where we're seeing a lot of progress. Uh, so there's a lot that's happening, but I think the biggest message that I would have is that while well, measurement is important, uh, we can't we can't wait. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
just want to add to that that, like in a good management team, good managed team, those leaders of the different initiatives should come together and discuss, okay, you do that, I do that, let's come back and discuss again in a year or two or later or, or shorter. So it's, it's a very important to communicate between leaders while uh, taking action. Maybe just one more comment to that, because what's also very important is that th we have a huge problem in closing the loop. So I think what's important is that all the stakeholders involved in closing material cycles and closing the loop need to talk to each other. The initial material producers, the trans uh, processors, the users, the recyclers, polit politics, they need to come together and find solutions. And that's uh, what, also what you said. I mean, uh, within an industry or within a value chain, as well as across them. Mm -hmm. the, the Scale 360 Chile initiative that is run by Sofofa, which is the largest industry group in, in Chile, is hosting, actually over these weeks, co-creation sessions focused on cross-industry symbi symbiosis. So they're bringing together the seven largest industries and the largest companies in those industries in Chile to, under NDA, share their waste streams and actually look at, from a mine, what are some of the materials that are currently being wasted that could kind of become uh, inputs into other businesses and vice versa. And are coming up with some really neat, actually actionable ideas, as well as ideas that they're channeling into universities. And so that can happen kind of within one value chain, but also across them. That's exactly what's needed. You know, the building industry, the fashion industry, all of those need to talk about the, the difficulties they share to have in order to to reach circularity or change the economic system. Um, okay, oh, thanks. So my question please introduce was, yourself shortly. Oh, my name is uh, Mutembe Kariki, I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. And at some point of my life, I you know, worked in the waste management um, industry in Tokyo, so I was on the tracks and everything. Then going back home, I realized that people will want the same like, standard of living as like in Tokyo, eating out, buying things all the time. So I'm trying to understand how we'll be able to, especially for the emerging markets who, let's say Europe right now is about a billion people. In, by 2050, Africa will be 2.5 billion people. All of those will have moved to like middle income, most likely. And they'll want the same goods. How are we going to change the economic systems where now these people who are going to be living at that time will want the same things that probably Europeans are having right now, uh, same quality of life, and the economic system we have now in terms of the companies which are, which are succeeding now have been doing that based on an old system of, let's say, coal, using other materials. And it's really expensive to change that. But a lot of these emerging markets, they don't have the investment to change their industries so we can have a circular economy. What are some of your thoughts on what's going to happen for these emerging markets to change? What is needed for them to change in terms of investment? Are there some things that you're already doing to get investment into these markets as well, to make that change? It's a very important question. Who would like to start? I can start with an unpopular opinion. Thank um, you. <laughs> That's what we need. Well, and, and one of those is, is to recognize we've been, I, I feel like I've been a systems voice here, kind of in the different perspectives that we have. And one is that in our system, the prices that are paid for goods and services, but largely we're talking about goods here, are not real costs, that we're not pricing in the climate impacts of products. And until we're looking at products more holistically and our economic systems more holistically, uh, we're not necessarily going to be able to kind of break the foundations of our kind of economy the way that it's needed to. And so it doesn't get at necessarily geography to geography, but I think it is looking at um, goods, the price of goods and how goods are created. Um, yeah, so I basically agree to that, and, uh, and and what's happening in all these countries is that they're copying what we've been doing wrong, right? So basically, um, I, I think um, as us privileged societies, we we do have a, a responsibility, like a, a big one, to to go and show the way. Also, when it comes to climate mitigation, Germany has been historically the figure, uh, fourth biggest emitter worldwide. So it's really about leading the way and taking on this responsibility and, and, and things hopefully will get copied. And then some of the biggest companies, which then kind of do the packaging each by each and like really creating a massive problem, they're, they're operating worldwide, right? So it basically it's that sort of responsibility I think this huge corporations have and I think if we get things right here hopefully it will spread and then obviously there's always regulations as well. 
maybe also one last answer to the question. I think um, circular economy is the only answer we have so that 2050 we can still live the same uh, standard. <laughs> because otherwise uh, we, will don't, we won't have the same resource amount that we have now. So the resources sources get shorter and shorter and shorter. And um, if we want to stop that, we need to start thinking in cycles. And also, of course, it is costly to do the transition, for sure. But then after having done the transition, it's not more expensive than before. It's even can be even cheaper if you use materials that you don't need to dig out of the ground. Um, if you take, for example, a company in Germany producing sanitary products, cleaning products, they took um, yeah, the, the plastic packaging out of the recycling stream, like 100% recycled plastics out of the Gelber Sack in German. Um, now it's, it's not more expensive for them, but it, of course it was an investment, but now they have a circular packaging and um, it's not more expensive. I come again with my own opinion to that point too, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll give you the chance, Frank, to ask I'm a question. I, I'm, I'm the head of the, the Bering England Venture Fund, so that means I'm an investor as well. But I'm also representing uh, pharma industry. Pharma industry, as you know, is one of the most profitable industry you can think about, yeah? But it's also one of the highest regulated industry. What I see in our industry, if you want to implement changes, either you go through regulation, that you put the, the bars for bringing a certain product to the market higher, or you change the price to make certain products more profitable than other ones. That's why most of the pharma industry is in oncology and not in other indication areas. Where do you see the most impact? Either in a regulation, that means that you just say producing waste should be much, much more expensive, and avoiding waste is much cheaper, or do you see also in the circular economic, uh, economy a chance that via the market mechanism, that means via uh, producing things cheaper, more efficient, you can also be more competitive? I think that's a very, very basic discussion, but I would like to get your input from, from the industry, and especially also as an investor, where, where do you get your payoff for your investment? Yeah? Uh, as a venture fund, there's a certain time of uh, uh, investment, you need to get some money back, otherwise you cannot invest further, yeah? That's clear. Where do we see the, the, the most impactful, or the way of the politics to bring the world to a more circular economy way? Regulation or market mechanism, mainly price, quality, durability, and something like that. Thank you for the question. I'll, I'll start with Fritjof, as you are under the spot right now. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think regulation is the faster tool, um, and um, development of prices is more predictable, I would say. Um, I mean, coming back to the case of the e kerosene company, we, we invest in, we know the price is going to go up to a certain level and therefore we can justify that we did the investment and so we know it's probably, in a, it's probably going to be a good bet. Um, if you know that a regulation for sure is coming, you could do the same bet, but it's sometimes tough to anticipate, right? So, um, I mean, it's basically we have to change the... <laughs> Well, the way I look at, at this is kind of, we had, in the different sectors we address, we have different speeds, and in, in every nation they go in different speeds. It might be regulations, might be price development. And I think it is looking through this lens of where is innovation, where you see regulation coming up or a price increase, and then you try to mix it all together and make a solid judgment. Um, so... I think the faster one would be regulation, but the more predictable one would be price increases of external utilities. So, well, it's hard. It's a tough question. So, I'll, I'll briefly bring in also a global perspective to that um, because of your question. I think theoretically everyone needs to change now and be on board and 
actually need to regulate the market very clearly. Uh, just like coming from Egypt myself and seeing like the development, I know that when I grew up, I was eating organic food and very circular conform uh, food, and then suddenly there were the dull bananas, and everything was suddenly linked to another uh, importance that bananas should look like that and not the the, or, the, the organic ones. And now we start paying more for the organic bananas, <laughs> which we had in the first place in the beginning if we didn't have a lot of influence on import, export, and the global market perspectives. So I think going now back to the having all the regulations fitted and you're not industrialized yet and having all of these challenges in North Africa, Africa, other countries, is quite a challenge. And there has to be a role to play with companies and governments here and in the South and together because now that everyone decided <coughs> 2030 is the goal, we're not there yet in so many nations and continents. We cannot switch. And this is like a conversation on COP, like India said 2070, whatever, like there are different paces, but we need to prioritize now the, the climate action and goal over the profitability globally. And this is, I think, the most difficult step that many companies and corporates and governments don't want to take, but if you prioritize the impact while keeping the economy going and <laughs> running, it's difficult, but this is the task. The task is not um, yeah, monetary only. I need to take one last question. We heard this. We have five minutes, and I'll give you the chance to talk, but <laughs> and we need to... Yeah, do you want to have a... Yeah, maybe. So for, for me, I think, looking at the time, we, we need regulations because we cannot wait for the market that maybe they will head in that direction. And I also, well, especially, uh, I like to talk about uh, examples, especially in, in the plastics industry, the regulations that came, for example, from the EU really changed a lot. The plastics industry is like desperately looking for a new alternative, new solution. And that's good because they're waking up because it's quite a conservative industry. And I just wanted to say that also from regulations, a lot of potential for new development occurs. And it's not only banning stuff, but then innovation comes up. Please. Okay, I'm Miklos Jerfi, a former research administrator at the European Parliament. My question would be, I assume you are aware that the European Commission came out with an action plan on circular economy, a new action plan in 2020. The question would be, to what extent this fulfills the expectancies, you can use it, or is not enough? would like to answer. That's a very concrete one. We take a minute to answer that so I can have the closing round here. Helen. I think it's, so you were calling on me, but I actually am really interested in what Dr. Lamp has to say because you are working actually actively in the EU with a circular product, kind of whether you've seen an impact. I would say that the, a roadmap we see as a huge step for governments recognizing the importance of circular economy, and they can be very actionable. Chile launched a, a circular economy roadmap in the last year. The UAE has launched a circular economy roadmap. We are seeing more countries prioritizing circular within their policy frameworks. <coughs> but I think sometimes the things that are more active actionable or are kind of more concrete regulations, so I'd be interested to hear what you, and your perspective. And how practical is it? So, Just one sentence. <laughs> yeah, I think we need concrete regulations and concrete um, new rules for the market, and then it will be very helpful. Roadmaps are good to, to point out a vision, and the market can like see in which direction it will go into the future, but they need concrete, um, yeah. I'll add the point of awareness of the customers and the people, because it's very important to raise the awareness and the confidence that you're making an active decision as a consumer, as a person. Society needs to be playing a big role in this transition, and uh, whether we regulate it or we have the market pricing, etc., we need to do this in parallel. It's so exciting. It's so I'm getting the dead zone. I wanted to ask about. Uh, walls to be broken, but I'll give you that question to take with you home. What do you think are walls that need to be broken to accelerate change for a circular future? Please think about it, discuss about it, and thank you for being here. Thank you for the panelists. <laughs>